Hi, and welcome back to another episode of the Relationship Schools Smart Couple Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Gaddis. Welcome to episode 201 here from Boulder, Colorado. We are psyched to have you as a listener. So thanks for all your comments, shares, likes, and just listening. And ideally, you're learning something. So in the last episode, we celebrated our 200th anniversary, and we had a contest. And I quickly want to cover that, and then we'll get into who our next guest is. This is a big one. So Heather Bracey, congratulations. You win the coaching session with me. This is a $600 value, and I'm psyched to help you in some way. Thanks for playing, and thanks for following the contest rules so diligently. There were really three pretty straightforward ones that a lot of people didn't get, but you did. So thank you. And uh, fun to have your video. It's really sweet to see you share in the Smart Couple Facebook group. So you, my friend, are getting 45 minutes with me. And we're going to go there. And I'm going to help you tons, hopefully. Okay, so follow up with my team on that. I think we've already sent you an email. Anyway, very psyched to serve you. Now, second place for effort and didn't quite check all the boxes, but came really close was Tree. Um, Tree, we're going to give you $200 off any of our courses. Um, And you'll have a week to decide what you're going to do there. And then Alexander and Leah, just want to say thank you for putting in the effort, recording a video. And just as a consolation prize, we're going to give you a choice of relationship school store credit for $30. So shirt, hat, uh, mug, uh, sweatshirt, something like that, or a signed copy of the Smart Couple quote book, personally signed by me, and we'll mail that out to you. All right, so you guys decide on that. And again, thank you so much for playing. We, uh, we'd love it when you, the listeners, play here and you put yourselves out there. It's so vulnerable to just share your truth in a Facebook group and have people watch it or not watch it. Um, It's just, you know, it's vulnerable. So thanks so much. And again, thanks for supporting us here uh, for 200 episodes. Awesome. We will be doing another contest or game or giveaway at some point. And just stay tuned. We always like to give stuff away here. There'll be more opportunities for coaching, uh, for discounts at the Relationship School, and so forth. We have an Embracing Conflict weekend coming up. Now we have the official dates. Pencil this in November 9th, 10th, 11th, which is uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday in November. So make sure you save those dates. And we will uh, see you here in Boulder, Colorado to embrace conflict. Okay, It's a weekend workshop all about conflict for people like you that need to learn probably a little bit more. All right. Okay, in this episode, we've got Mr. Dan Savage, the legend, all right? This guy is most known for his um, love, Savage Love uh, column that he writes. I read that years ago. I think it was in the back of like a weekly thing here in Boulder, the Boulder Weekly, and I just thought it was genius. The guy's funny. He's got a great sense of humor, and he can be cutting and spot on sometimes, and he's a gay guy who gives tons of relationship advice to so many, so many people, thousands and thousands of people. Uh, He started the It Gets Better movement to help prevent suicide among LGBTQ youth. Um, And he's worked as a theater director. He's written books. um, He's a media pundit, journalist, activist for the gay community. And the guy is just a force, really. He's married. He's got a kid. Um, I like in this interview, we talk about his marriage. We talk about how they divide and conquer in the home, who does what chores. And uh, I think it's really interesting. And I, it was, it was quite um, just relaxing and um, enjoyable and straightforward to meet with this guy. We met in Denver in person. We don't have a video of this because he was like, no video. So I was like, all right, cool. I respect that. And we hung in his hotel room in Denver. Uh, he was here to give a Q&A session at the Oriental Theater in Denver. 
and I got to catch him before that. And so I'm really grateful to get time with him because he wasn't feeling great. He did the interview anyway, and we had, I had a great time. I'll just speak for myself. Um, and he's got some really strong opinions. Uh, you'll see them laid out here in this episode, um, particularly about monogamy. And I felt like I was a good listener. I pushed back a little bit, but I like to let Dan just kind of go for it with his perspective. And I certainly have a bit of a different opinion or experience about monogamy only because I live it in my own life. Um, you know, he and I both see monogamy done so poorly in this culture and his big frame is, you know, it's kind of unrealistic. So, but I beg to differ in that for some people it can be amazing. And I don't know, maybe, maybe you, since you're listening to this podcast, since we're mostly about long-term relationship with one person here. Um, yeah. So I'd be curious what you think, throw your comments there below the episode in Facebook or in the blog. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, just let us know what you think. And all right, let's get right into it. Uh, without further ado, here's Dan. All right. Welcome to the show, Dan Savage. Thank you for having me. Yeah, man. I'm super psyched to be connecting with you and seeing you here in person in Denver and grateful for your opinions and your heart and what you do in the world. <laughs> well, thank you. It's so good to say. Yeah, for sure. Um, I want to start just kind of getting right into it here. Um, you have a, I heard a quote from of yours, I watched a video of yours on Mind Valley, and you said, every monogamous relationship is a disaster waiting to happen. And I'm quoting uh, a British sex researcher and writer there whose name escapes me because I'm a pothead. Um, so that's not my line, but I yeah. frequently uh, like to cite it. That doesn't mean disaster can't come to a non-monogamous couple. Non-monogamous couples have rules. It is possible for a non-monogamous couple to cheat. Uh, but a non-monogamous couple uh, has diffused the bomb that blows up so many monogamous relationships. Um, yeah. And I think they're less likely to experience uh, cheating if the rules are bent or broken as the existential relationship extinction level event that a monogamous couple usually experiences infidelity mm -hmm. as. Yeah, and there and, and we say just just for context for the listener, you often call yourself monogamish. Mm -hmm. And then there's the most of the listeners here, I think, are into monogamy. Will you tell us the difference there? Um, God, there's just so many terms. Uh, it's easy when you talk about monogamy because that's just one thing. Here are two people who don't fuck anybody else. And often in a long-term relationship, don't even fuck each other. Uh, Non-monogamy um, takes many, many forms from, uh, you know, these are people who occasionally have a three-way. These are people who have a DADT or don't ask, don't tell arrangement where if something happens and I want to know about it and I don't approve, but people are people, people make mistakes, just make sure I never find out. Um, to uh, polyamory, openness. Um, I coined the, the term monogamish, which a lot of people have embraced, and that's been very exciting, to describe my relationship with my husband. Because uh, at the height of the marriage equality debate and movement, I wrote a book called The Commitment, where we talked about, I talked about the fact that we were not monogamous. Because a lot of gay male couples aren't. Um, and a lot of people during the marriage equality debate were saying, why shouldn't uh, loving, committed, monogamous gay couples be allowed to marry? And that bothered me because we were a loving, committed, non-monogamous gay couple. Um, and monogamy is not something we require of straight people if they wish to marry. Um, all of the things that uh, people who oppose marriage equality or marriage rights for same-sex couples threw out there as definitional, as required for marriage, are not required for marriage if you're straight. You know, we were told gay people can't get married because, you, you, because marriage is about children, marriage is about monogamy, marriage is about religion. Meanwhile, straight couples could marry uh, at City Hall, they could marry and not have children, they could marry and be not monogamous. Straight people could write their own ticket, do their own thing, create their own marriages, but we had to marry in the 19th century, uh, gay couples who wished to marry. So after I said that we were not monogamous, at this time when it was really kind of risky politically for a gay couple to say that, particularly a uh, gay couple who were parents, as my husband and I are, mm -hmm. People made assumptions about the amount of sex we were having with other people. <laughs> yeah, like we um, do. Yeah, yeah that, like we were on Grinder all the time, or we were, you know, there were strange men in and out of our house all the time mm -hmm. while we were parenting. And 
I kept having to explain to people we were much more monogamous than not monogamous. We mm -hmm. almost always only had sex with each other. Under very certain limited circumstances, we could have sex with other people. Yeah. Um, and I got so tired of saying, you know, we're mostly monogamous, more monogamous than not. Yeah. I just started saying we're monogamish, mostly monogamous, <laughs> monogamous with some squish uh, at the end or our ends on occasion. Um, yeah. And what monogamish kind of in, like communicates is you know, we are pair bonded partners um, sexually into each other. We have a vibrant sexual relationship with each other, but we allow for attraction to others. Some people use monogamous to describe their sexually monogamous relationship. They're just no longer policing each other for evidence mm -hmm. of what we should all accept uh, to be true. Of course, your partner, even in a monogamous relationship, wants to fuck other people. Yeah, they might be attracted to someone else. Right, right. just as you want to fuck other people. But think of the amount of time that people in committed monogamous relationships waste busting each other uh -huh. and creating conflict in their relationship by dragging each other over the coals when you see evidence of what you just know is true. Of course your partner sometimes wants to fuck other people. If being in love meant you had no desire to fuck other people, you wouldn't have to make a monogamous commitment. It would be an unspoken default setting. Mm -hmm. A monogamous commitment says, for you, I will not I will not have sex with anybody else. I'm just, this is going to be special. Just you and I are going to be sex partners to the exclusion of all else, despite temptation. Yeah. So, uh, you know, you just think the letters I get at Savage Love from people who are freaked out because he looked at that barista because her personal trainer is really hot because looked at porn or whatever it is. Uh, and it makes me feel like I'm not enough. It makes me feel like yeah. he or she is attracted to other people. And you know what? He or she is absolutely positively attracted to other people just as you are. Mm -hmm. And if we could just accept that. And a lot of people accept that and then use monogamous to describe it because it allows for that desire it's even pernicious. if it's not acted on. Yeah. Um, but other people use monogamous to mean, you know, occasionally at parties we'll hook up with other people, just like dance and grind or make out. Or occasionally we have sex together with a, a, someone else. Or occasionally if something happens with someone else in a way that's discreet, that doesn't... Uh, that a lot, you know, a lot of people who are monogamous are what we call uh, socially monogamous, but not sexually monogamous. Mm -hmm. uh, socially monogamous, not sexually monogamous. A lot okay. of monogamous people are couples who, although they're not monogamous, wish to be perceived as monogamous by friends, neighbors, family, uh -huh. children. Uh, and so they have sex in, with other people occasionally in such a way where it doesn't bleed out. Yeah. They don't fuck the neighbors. They don't fuck coworkers. They don't fuck their wives, sisters, or friends. They don't fuck their personal trainer. Um, but there are certain circumstances under which, uh, together or separately, some outside sexual contact is permissible within the relationship. Uh, are you familiar with adult attachment stuff? It's kind of more popular now in like a kind of a partnered pair bonding All the situation. Love hormone bullshit. I mean, not so much love hormone, more like um, we're wired. Once we actually partner with someone, and you and your husband probably experience this, is the way we trigger each other in our nervous systems over time and can mimic the childhood home of, of like a parent child dynamic where we, we want to, yeah, and we want to actually try to help each other feel safe because your nervous system is kind of threatening to mine. And so mm -hmm. there's this, we can in a way reparent each other and grow each other up through a long term relationship. Mm -hmm. you've, you've yeah, but once you start parenting each other, then you are not as erotic a figure to yeah. each other. Eroticism well, if you're, requires, if you're just living by that frame, parenting, I, yes. Or, well, eroticism sense. requires distance and mystery and risk. Yeah. Um, people often ask, you know, someone in my position, how do you keep the spark alive 10, 15 years into a marriage or relationship, seven years, five years into it? You know, Terry and I are almost 25 years into it and we're still fucking each other a lot. Um, and if you remember what it was like at the beginning of the relationship, you did barely knew each other. Mm -hmm. um, it was a little dangerous uh, yeah. to make yourself vulnerable in front of this person that you barely knew. What if they're unsafe? What if they're lying to you about everything? What if they're crazy? Um, you know, what if they're physically violent? You don't know anything about them, and yet you're undressing with them and getting in bed with them, mm -hmm. um, falling asleep next to them afterwards. They could slit your throat in the middle of the night. And all of that makes adrenaline pump and is very arousing. And, you know, 10 years in, you know that person. And that person, unless they're withholding things from you, is not a mystery. Mm -hmm. uh, and so how do you recreate that feeling of danger, risk, everything that made the adrenaline pump at the beginning of the relationship? You have to engineer it. Yeah. Um, so maybe you get out of the house and don't have sex in your bed. Have sex in the woods. Go to a sex club or a sex party. Even if you're only going to have sex with each other, just be in a, like, mm -hmm. an erotic environment where there's some risk and danger 
uh, and that creates some self-consciousness that arousal has to uh, drag you over your uh, inhibitions, just this, as it did at the beginning yeah. of the relationship. And this is the assumption, though, that that's if you're in a long-term relationship where there's not, you're not still turned on. Like, I'm right. still turned on by my wife. It's only right. been 11 years, but people, still, I'm, I'm like, she's I hot. I always have to remember that people who aren't having the problem don't write to me about the problem. Right. So I can't okay. impute to all people in long-term relationships that 10 years in, they're bored. Yeah. If they're having sex exactly. in the same way they were 10 years ago. Um, some people aren't, but many, 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 many people yeah. are. Sexless relationships and sexless marriages are a huge issue. Yeah. In part because the culture sends us all sorts of messages about the way love is supposed to work that aren't really the way love actually does work. True. The more comfortable you get with someone, the more you're farting in front of them and they're farting in front of you, yeah. the less turned on you often are. <laughs> Just because farts not, aren't a turn on, man? No, they're not a turn on for most of us. <laughs> they're not a turn on um, if you're lucky. Nobody picks their kinks. But I feel bad for the people who farting is their kink. Um, but yeah, the longer you're with somebody, uh, it usually drains. Esther Perel writes about this very smartly. You should she does. Esther Perel. Oh, yeah. She's on the list. Um, yeah. You know, that we expect everything from our partners. Uh, we expect comfort, intimacy, familiarity, ease. We also expect risk, danger. Uh, and exciting sex for five decades. Yeah, there's like all this new pressure on marriages to deliver it all. To deliver right. it all, right. And yeah. and what I'm often in the position of saying, and I make myself unpopular by saying, when someone says to me, it makes me feel like I'm not enough for my partner, I always respond, you aren't. Uh huh. Like you're never going to live up to that standard. Right, you're never going right. to live up to that standard. One person can't be all things to another person, emotionally yeah. or sexually. It's fine for... Your spouse or partner should be fine for your spouse or partner to get certain needs, not sexual if you're monogamous, met elsewhere for emotional intimacy or, sure. uh, you know, an intense romantic friendship. Um, you know, people are so easily threatened that they're threatened by the fact that their partner likes to go hiking and they don't. And they go do that with other friends who take as much joy in that as they do. And they're like, well, I don't want my partner experiencing that kind of transcendent joy with anyone else mm -hmm. only me which means they're not allowed to hike anymore because I take no joy in that yeah that's terrible and that's insane it's confronting like, like contracting and like you can't be you and yeah but people yeah. do that to each other yeah we have to be all sure. things to each other we're never apart um, we meet each other's emotional social sexual needs 100% no one else can step in and meet a need because that makes me feel insecure or like I'm not enough mm -hmm. and if you can just go I am not enough this is a need, an emotional need, a social need I can't meet. Please find people who can right. meet that for you because I want you to have it, mm -hmm. but I can't provide it. Yeah. You know, an example of my own relationship, uh, my husband's 46 now and he doesn't do this anymore, but, you know, we had a kid really young, he's 25, and when our kid was like 10, 11, 12, my husband had this itch to start going out clubbing, going out dancing. He loves music, loves dance music. He was dancing to uh, electronic music the night I met him. Mm -hmm. um, and he wanted to go out, and I would rather roll around in a waiting pool full of razor blades than go out to a gay bar and dance all night. Mm -hmm. And so he did that with other people. Yeah, because you couldn't meet that need. You didn't want to. Right, and I didn't have to. Yeah. And he didn't d demand that I meet that need. He didn't want me in the bar miserable and wanting to go home and ruining the night for him. Yeah. And I didn't want him not to have that. And so I was like, you know, go go do that. Even though that meant, and I knew it meant, you know, there'd be times he'd on the dance floor and some guy's grinding on him. Sure. That's okay. Because yeah. I'm not going to do it. Yeah. And I know you're coming home to me. Uh -huh. And if you want to fuck the guy who ground on you in our relationship, that just means we have to have a conversation about it. Uh -huh. So let me get back to this attachment piece that um, a lot of people talk about now. Is there's a primary, like in, a, in an open relationship or a monogamish relationship, that you and your husband are pair primary bonded. for each other, right? Yeah, primary partners and pair bonded. Yeah. I, I believe in the pair bond. I think okay. that's a real thing. And so introducing a third... Um, there's obviously tons of different models on this and how to do this. What, what's the like way you recommend? Um, and does someone there? Does there? Is it true? A lot of people say in a poly or open relationship that yes, there has to be a primary. No, there are other, there are people in polyland with non-hierarchical open relationships or polyamorous relationships where the partners are all equal. Um, often in a couple, uh, the partners aren't equal. Uh, equal is really hard. Uh, an equal balance of you know power in the relationship is almost impossible for two people to manage, to, to divide power into 33 and a third percent piles in a three-person relationship, or 25% piles in a four-person relationship. 
that's why so many poly people have this reputation for processing and talking all the time because how do you do that yeah it's um, a lot of talking it's a lot of effort mm-hmm. um you know, into having a third person, we always call them very special guest stars, VSGSs. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, for a long time, we called them VSGSs. Uh, um, you know, we have lesbian friends who, and Terry, who asked Terry and I how we like do our open thing, and after we explained it to them, they were like, "Oh my God, you two together are one lesbian," because mm-hmm. we tended to have like one guy who we sometimes messed around with, who we got to know and like, and became close mm-hmm. to. Um, in a couple instances, they ended up uh, living with us for a while. Uh, and that was fine and intimate and easy and breezy. I grew up in a big house and relatives always came and stayed for months or years at a time. And I have a big house now and with just my husband and I, our son, it feels kind of empty if somebody wants to like camp out in the guest room for a few months, like makes it feel more like home for me. Right. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, how do you bring that third in? You have to know what you want, know what works for you, but you have to be adaptable and you have to allow for what you want or what you're comfortable with to change and evolve over time while you keep checking in and speaking with each other. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, most people who are non-monogamous were monogamous. You know, a lot of people look at non-monogamous couples going, oh my God, that's crazy. I could never do that. And a lot of non-monogamous people look at monogamous people and say, I did do what you're doing now. Yeah. And I know this is crazy. No, but often it did. Uh Like what works for you at one point may not be what works for you eternally. Yeah. Which is why... Uh, monogamy and everything in your relationship needs to be continually renewed and discussed and opted into rather Mm -hmm. than default settings that make people miserable and unhappy. Almost all non-monogamous couples were monogamous at the start of the relationship at one point. Terry and I were monogamous for four years. Um, Non-monogamous for 20 years. It's always hilarious when people tell me that non-monogamous relationships are unstable and doomed to fail. It's like, well, how many decades do we need to do this before we get some credit for stability and, right, and non-failure? Yeah. Uh, that's Anyway, we can talk about that later probably. Uh, what was the question? I'm sorry. Well, I didn't sleep last night. If a, if a, no worries. If a third comes in, uh, I'm just wondering about the impact and how you talk about it. And one thing I'm wondering right now is, because you're acknowledging, yeah, my husband and I are a pair bond. And... Is there sort of an explicit agreement then that like you're my primary and I'm not I'm coming back to you and you need reassurance even if one of you gets jealous yeah, or hurt? Yeah, jealousy it's happens. It's like look, hey, no, you're my primary and you gotta right. say all the words. You're and, my first priority. Yeah. Us together, uh, Terry and I call us the firm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like we're the thing, we're the firm, we're the um, the institution, uh, and other guys that we've had who were boyfriends, uh, whom we have loved very much and. Uh, are still uh, guys we're not seeing anymore, not intimate with anymore sexually, are still our really close friends. Um, they come for Christmas Day. We have a big open house and for Christmas Eve dinner. Uh, you know, it's a relationship. There's some mm-hmm. people out there like, oh, I could do non-monogamy if, you know, occasionally there was a third person who we didn't know, who we would never ever see ever again yeah. and would evaporate as soon as the sex was done and had no <laughs> needs or desires of their own yeah. and made no demands or requests in other words, it wasn't no, a person. <laughs> yeah, required no emotional investment. Okay, that's a toaster uh-huh. with a flashlight duct tape to it. That's not a human being. The, the thing that a lot of people have a problem with, uh, with ca- sometimes with casual sex, sometimes with you know three ways or sexual adventures for a couple, is that other person is a human being, just like mm-hmm. you two are human beings. Mm-hmm. And it, you two need to take each other's needs and feelings and insecurities into account, but also your thirds needs, feelings, and insecurities have to be taken into account. Totally. You have to treat that person like a human being and not a toaster with a flashlight duct tape to it yeah, or a dildo duct tape to it. And some people really trip up on that. Does the and third... some people are really, you know, some people don't want to see their partner being kind or considerate right. to a third right. because kindness and consideration is just for me. Yeah, hey, come on, that belongs to me. Right, like as if it's a, a, a scarce resource or a limited resource. Mm-hmm. As if kindness and, and, and generosity and concern and compassion uh isn't something that we're all capable of doing and infinitely capable of doing. And yeah. my partner can treat, uh, you know, my partner has a boyfriend uh, who I really like uh, and enjoy spending time with. Um, and he treats him with concern and compassion. And I don't look at that and say, hey, he's getting my slice of the concern and compassion pie. Because mm-hmm. it's not a pie. Yeah. Um, it is something Terry does and is capable Part of, of who doing. he is. And... and he does it for me and he can do it for his boyfriend and I don't feel threatened by that. Actually, I feel good about that. I wouldn't want to be with someone who treated a sex partner like a toaster with a 
flashlight duct tape to it. Yeah. Like an object. Yeah. That would make me feel insecure about how he regarded me or how he treated me. Totally. Yeah. Okay. Um, you said people are committed to monogamy as a concept, right? Not to other people. You said something like that. Mm -hmm. I heard you say that. Can you explain that? <laughs> well, that often comes up when... Um, this has happened to me multiple times where someone has said, oh, I could never do what you and Terry do. I could never have an open relationship. Um, because I value commitment too highly. And then the next thing out of their mouth is all three of my marriages were monogamous. Mm -hmm. So they yeah. were committed to monogamy, track record. not committed to the people that they married. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's a problem. And the religious institution or whatever institution that promotes monogamy, let's say, can be, again, I'm buying into a concept rather than there's another human being here that I have right. to deal with and relate to and there's going to be challenges. And uh, Deal with, relate to, there may be ch accommodations that have to be made. Um, that you don't want to sacrifice the relationship or each other on the altar of some ideal. Uh, a lot of people feel like they fail at monogamy or monogamy uh, isn't something that they can do and what they need to get through their heads is maybe monogamy is failing you. Maybe monogamy is not right for mm -hmm. you. Uh, it's a real problem in monogamous relationships when people who can't do monogamy keep trying and failing yeah. and making monogamous commitments they can't Uphold. Those of us are out there saying, non monogamy is a thing and it's a wonderful and rewarding thing and it's a relationship model that works for many people. I aren't trying to talk all monogamous people into being non monogamous. Yeah. We, it would be great for people who were monogamous and, and valued monogamy and wanted monogamy uh, if people who were bad at it, couldn't do it, yeah. could conceive of it, th that before they like step on the rake 30 or 40 times, before yeah. they have divorced three times because they keep failing at this thing. You don't want people making a monogamous commitment they can't keep. Yeah. Do you, can you, this is kind of a really maybe dumb basic question, but what's your, is there a difference between a gay relationship and a hetero relationship in terms of whether you're monogamish or uh, straight or uh, monogamy? Well, it's easier in a gay, rela a same sex relationship uh, to have, you know, a third is equally attractive potentially to both partners. Uh, unless you're with somebody who's bi. Uh, the third may not be equally attractive to both partners. Also, there's you know years of socialization that you know you have to pick one person and you can only love one person at a time. Um, gay people get to write their own ticket and make their own way. And you mean there's more liberating. freedom. There is more li yeah. more liberation more liberation from uh, gender stereotypes from uh, gendered roles, um, which is why in gay relationships monogamy has always been an, an opt in a conversation that that couple had about mm -hmm. whether that was what they both wanted to do. And for too many straight people, it's the default setting. It's not something Yeah, it's what you about. do when you're 30 or whatever. So my parents told me so, or because my neighbors are doing it, so I better just get married. Yeah. That's default setting, right? Yeah, default settings. And maybe the default setting is going to work for you and make you happy, but maybe it's not. Yeah. Yeah, I was very anti-monogamy, marriage, and kids for many years. And then I had a teacher that introduced this concept of monogamy as a path or just marriage or relationship as like a path to wholeness, to awakening, to, you know, more of a spiritual kind of journey. And once I took that frame on, monogamy for me got way more exciting mm -hmm. uh, just because I, it was a personal growth vehicle, you know, my awesome. wife and I helping each other grow and become the best versions of ourselves. So in that way, mm. I, well, that's how it was for me. Okay. Yeah. What makes you say, mm? Well... The, the valorization of monogamy. And maybe that's not how you meant it. But now that I'm monogamous, I'm the best version of myself. Now, yeah, maybe no, what I'm you not meant making is that association. Monogamy is the best relationship model for you. Yeah. And so that's for the best me, version of yourself. Vehicle. It's, a, it's the best vehicle to help me confront my bullshit. Okay. Yeah. I validate that. <laughs> but usually what people mean by, you know, now I'm the best version of myself is monogamy is the best choice for all yeah. rather than this is something that totally. I need to do no, that I, works for me. Yeah. And that's, you know, everyone should be trying to figure out to know themselves. What do I need? What works for me? What will make me happy? What will make my relationships low conflict and joyful? And everyone is bullied into thinking when they're young that that is monogamy. Yeah. That love is monogamy and monogamy is love. Um, and if you're in love, you're not going to want to have sex with anybody else. Um, and that's just not the case for all. It seems like it's really changing, though, don't you think? Don't you think, like, monogamish and with your work and 
just the gay movement as a whole, it's like in, in open relationships and Burning Man and like it's way more okay now mm -hmm. than ever. To, I do think to so. have more multiple... people are telling their truths, and I think the gay rights movement gets a lot of the credit for that. Yeah. Um, you know, I started writing Savage Love almost uh, thirty years ago, <laughs> wow. and uh, I think what straight people took from the gay rights movement was look at all the different. You know, straight people go to a gay pride parade or are exposed to one, and they see the leather guys and the drag queens and the go-go boys and their sparkly jock straps and the dykes on bikes and the you know gay business organizations and the gay churches um you know and the trans folks and the, and the different you know the bisexual marchers they just see that there's like a million different ways to be queer why is there just one way to be straight right maybe there should be as many ways to be straight <laughs> as there point. are to be queer yeah and you should look inside and figure out what is it that will make you happy what the, what kind of relationship a kind of um sexual expression mm -hmm. kind of relationship model is going to work for you rather than just being handed the script. It seems like that's kind of the core of your message when you say mm -hmm. is just find your own inner knowing and truth that works for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's awesome. Here's a quick interruption from our sponsor, The Relationship School. As you know, guys, we have a free web series right now. Go to relationshipschool.net forward slash free class to get free goodies on how to do a relationship really well, how to succeed over time. And we're enrolling for our nine month training. So come check us out. Here's what a few people had to say about our amazing training. It's an absolute game changer. It's changed my life. I just cannot emphasize enough the power of this course. This has been the best thing I've ever done for myself. And um, I'll take these tools, these people with me for the rest of my life. It's priceless for me, so I would do it again, and I'm going to do it again. Would you say this course prepared you for marriage? Uh, yeah, absolutely. 100%. Yeah. yeah. Changed my whole life. Now I'm a relationship coach, and I help people, and I feel super served by everything I've encountered here. Okay, your life and your relationships can change too if you come to the relationship school relationshipschool.net forward slash DPIR if you want to apply now or join us. It's going to be amazing. And this video, this is a short of a video. Go to that page to watch the full three minute video that's incredible about what we're doing here. And that's, uh, thanks Hannah for putting that video together and rocking it out. Okay guys, back to Dan Savage. Okay, listener question here for you. Okay. Uh, this is from Michelle. Uh, what will it take to transform the current broken norm model for marriage completely so the masses are doing it in a new and improved way? Oh my God, I have no idea. Centuries of cultural change, um, socializing uh, men not to feel entitled to women and women's bodies and women's attention and emotional labor and domestic labor, and socializing women not to uh, defer to men's needs and wants and to be more... Uh, vocal and uh, about what they need and they want in a relationship um, and better sex education <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean. so much is going to have to to change one thing that could help and could help right away is just people admitting what marriage actually is which mm -hmm. is whatever the two people in it say that it is yeah and if it's what both people in that marriage want it's valid um, and no one has a right outside that marriage to gainsay it Mm -hmm. And that can mean traditional Southern Baptist wife submits joyfully to the husband kind sure. of marriage. If that's what makes those people happy, they go, it's crazy, but makes you happy, knock yourselves out. <laughs> to, you know, some crazy femdom relationship marriage to uh, a same sex marriage, which can be pretty vanilla in gay land. You know, I'm, I know guys who are married, who are monogamous, who have kids, who are indistinguishable uh, emotionally and sexually, really, from straight couples and very similar kind of mm -hmm. traditional ish relationships. Um, to, you know, I, I know married straight couple who have a dungeon in their house and, and a million sex partners. And, you know, you go to dinner and there might be somebody in a cage downstairs. You don't know. Um, and I know gay couples who have a dungeon in their house, like, who yeah. are married. Yeah. I know gay porn stars who are married. Uh, marriage is whatever two people who want to commit to each other say that it is. Mm -hmm. And it is a, a, a social and emotional contract that a lot of um, cultural and religious kind of spangle and glitter has accrued around and then we can't see what it's at the core what's at the core of it because of all the like glitter and spangles and and jesus yeah. and hoo-ha 
and strip that all away and what are you left with are these two people happy together do these two people want the same things are they compatible emotionally and sexually or are they compatible emotionally and neither is particularly interested in sex and they have a companionate mm -hmm. marriage which works for many people um, what works for these two people that's what works not yeah. what works for everybody is this off the shelf opposite sex um, gendered uh, shot through with religious dogma and bullshit marriage yeah the spoiler play it deal right. spoon fed everybody when did you it's not a mold you're poured into as a couple you get to create your own mold yeah when did you have your own discoveries about yourself around relationship that, that like led you to some of these conclusions? A lot of it was getting mail and reading. Um, some of it was, you know, I was in a relationship for a few years where I had a very difficult time being faithful, and it was a monogamous relationship. Um, and I felt was it early twenties or early twenties? Yeah, okay. I felt guilty, felt like a failure, uh, and then just one day realized that maybe monogamy is wrong for me in the same way compulsory monogamy is wrong for me in the same way compulsory heterosexuality was wrong for me. Maybe it's not yeah. that I'm failing at being straight, but straight is failing me. Maybe yeah. I'm not failing at being monogamy. Maybe monogamy is failing me. And I left that relationship saying I will never be in a monogamous relationship ever again. <laughs> and then met Terry, who at the beginning of our relationship demanded monogamy. Mm -hmm. And I was like, all right, I will for you. How long did that last? Four years. Okay. And he initiated opening up our relationship when the time came. Uh -huh. So you were cool with it up until that time? Yeah, you I mean, it was like a bit of a struggle. Yourself? And we had some fights and arguments about it. Um, I didn't browbeat him into anything. There were just, uh, it just wasn't something I, you know, it was, it's like I always compared to like standing on one leg. Like you can do that. Yeah. It's hard to do that for five decades. Yeah. And that's basically what we ask people to do. When mm -hmm. we, we ask them to make a monogamous commitment. Mercifully, in a same-sex relationship, because men, I think, are a little bit more gay men, can't be gay men unless they can tell the truth about something that's very difficult to tell the truth about. Mm -hmm. You can't be a gay man if you didn't look your mom in the eye and say, I'm a cocksucker, right? Mm -hmm. Break her heart. Uh, so looking your boyfriend in the eye and being honest about the fact that you want to do X, Y, or Z sexually, or you think the barista is hot and take, should take, check him out, don't you agree? All of that is not scary. A lot of that shit for straight people is really scary. Yeah, like admitting sure. about you know the non-normative desires that you have and would like to experience for a straight person, that's really scary. You can't be a gay person unless you've embraced a non-normative desire, a very fundamental bedrock one. Yeah. Um, and likewise with relationships and, and, and monogamy and everything else. Um, you can't yeah. be gay if you haven't told your truth. You can be straight without ever telling your truth. Absolutely. That's why I, I have so much respect for the gay community because I feel like you're more honest. You have to be more honest in a way. Like I can... That's the ticket. A straight person can like not actually face themselves in the mirror and live with themselves. You know, they have other lies they're telling themselves, but this is such, like being gay, like that's such a big one. Mm -hmm. It seems like it, it almost forces you on a personal growth path. And it gives you some perspective. Way. And there are a lot of shitty gay people out there. I don't think gay people are shamans or um, are sure. involved uh, but gay people when it comes to sex and relationships I do think have an advantage uh, over straight people mm -hmm. because the heterosexual assumption the default setting around how you're going to be perceived uh, doesn't work uh, straight people don't have to come out um, straight people mm -hmm. don't have to tell a difficult truth to be straight people and so it makes telling your other truths seem terrifying and scary and huge which for us, for a gay person, for a gay man, those other truths are not in any way comparably scary or terrible. Right. They're not as big as the big one. Right. Telling your parents that you're gay uh, is really scary. It's huge. Telling your boyfriend that you don't think monogamy is something that you want compared to telling your parents you're yeah, right. a faggot <laughs> yeah. is really easy. Yeah. Wow. Um, how do you guys work out your differences? Just like one tip. What's Scream like your yell. favorite hack? Scream and yell. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> um, Shaming each other? <laughs> no, we had, we, Terry and I had friends who the first few years we were together. Uh, we hung out with these guys a lot. And they were a couple that had been together for a long time. And they never fought. And they called us the Bickersons because we were always like snapping at each other and arguing. Mm -hmm. And then one day they had their first fight and broke up. And we were like, oh, okay. <laughs> Maybe what we're doing kind of works because <laughs> um, we process conflict and then emerge from it together still yeah um and maybe we've had some breakup level fights and we didn't realize it because it was just one more tree in the forest of fights uh that we've had um 
it helps to have, I think, some some things you toss out when you're having those arguments you always have, which are, you know, Terry and I sometimes have arguments, and one of us will just pause and say, at least we're not bored. Mm-hmm. Like, okay, yeah. we're not bored, and we'll get through this. Right. Um, it's better than being in a relationship where you barely speak to each other and just kind of move through space together, and mm-hmm. there's, no, there's no tension yeah. that uh, binds you. Right, no spark. Yeah. Uh, it also helps to... I talk about the price of admission. It helps to identify the things about your partner that are never going to change and that you can't change and you should stop trying to change. Mm -hmm. And part of stop trying to change it is stop bitching about it. Yeah. Um, Because they just feel judged and criticized. Feel judged and criticized and and, and you're never going to get anywhere. You're just going to generate conflict in your relationship. Terry's a bit of a slob. I pick up after him all the time. I move through the house like an octopus putting things away. Early in our relationship, I would say, put that away, pick that up, do this, do that. And then one yeah. day I just like did it myself. I was like, well, that was easier. Mm-hmm. And so I do those things now. Yeah. You know, he makes a sandwich, he leaves everything on the counter. And I come through the kitchen and I put it away. <laughs> um, yeah. he used, I used to like go scream, come down here and put this away. We're all going to get botulism. You can't leave mayonnaise and ham sitting out in the summer. Um, and that yelling up the stairs to Terry to come put this shit away required more effort mm-hmm. and, and, and generated sourness. Yeah. That would ruin a whole day. Yeah, you sound like, like a nag, too. Yeah, know? so I just put it away. And then I said, you know, there's probably things that he does that I don't perceive where he's, mm-hmm. like, taking care of me. Um, this is easier, I think, in a same-sex relationship because, you know, a woman who's constantly picking up after a man is going to feel like this is gendered domestic division yeah, of labor. Yeah, just stuck in a traditional role. It's bullshit. Right, and this is yeah. sexism and my women's studies professor would be very mad at me right now if she saw me putting the mayonnaise and ham away because yeah. he's too lazy or stupid to put them away himself. Uh, so I think it's easier for us to to work that out. You know, mm-hmm. There's a lot of research into same-sex couples and they tend to be more egalitarian mm-hmm. uh, around the division of domestic labor. Terry does the laundry. Terry takes care of the car. I do yard work. If the house needs to be swept and vacuumed, that's usually me. Um, it, Terry does all the shopping and cooking. Um, I do the dishes. It, it, it sort of breaks out in unexpected ways. Yeah. Um, you know, Terry is very handy. So, you know, the sink is leaking or fucked up. He's in there with the wrench and I don't know what to do. There's a dead rat under the house. That's my job. Because <laughs> he does <laughs> not get dirty. That's great. Have you guys ever been to like therapy, coaching? Did you ever get stuck nope. and needed external support? We went to therapy. We, we, we had one appointment with a therapist who told us we didn't need her help. Because <laughs> uh, when we were about to adopt, he was still Mr. Monogamy. And I said, I'm not going to adopt with you if cheating, if a cheat, if, if an infidel, and it, you know, if one or the other of us cheats, uh, that means our, our relationship is over. Then we're bringing a kid into our relationship knowing our relationship is going to end. Yeah. Because the odds in a gay relationship that you or I or both of us are going to cheat on each other are pretty high. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to process that with a therapist. Because I didn't want to get to cheating is okay when we were monogamous. I wanted to get to we will not let this break us up. Mm-hmm. That our expectation, if this happens, will be we will work through it for this kid. Yeah. Not we get a get out of jail free card because there's a kid, but we will, the expectation will be that we will work through it. Um, and that's ultimately where we got. Because initially, Terry was like, if you ever cheat on me, I'm going to leave you. And I was like, well, we probably shouldn't adopt them. Right. Because that's, I, I don't think I'm going to cheat, but I don't know. Yeah. So you guys had to navigate all that. Yeah. Do you... And I think that's a conversation that all, even straight couples about to have kids should have. You look at the infidelity statistics. It used to be men cheated more. Now as women... And people would look at that and say, oh, women are better and they're the, they're the monogamous ones, but we're naturally easily monogamous. They're the nurturers. Uh, they're the people who sustain the pair bond. Um, and no, no, no. Women were terrorized. You know, divorce and um, violence and economic uh, you know, penury would fall to the woman if she was left by the man. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so it was a lot riskier for a woman to cheat. What you see now as women have become more economically equal to men is women cheating at the same rates that men cheat. And, you know, 30, 40% of women in long-term relationships cheat, 30, 40% of men. Those cheating men and women are are all married to each other. So the odds that your marriage, one or the other, both of you will cheat at one point are pretty high. So the conversation you should have early in the relationship isn't this will never happen if this ever happens I will leave you it's if this happens what are we going to do are Mm -hmm. we going to work through it 
or are we going to leave each yeah. other? And I think it's better to say we will work. We will try to work through it. You know, if you fuck her sister on your wedding night, odds are you can't work through that. Yeah, that kind of betrayal. Twenty years into a marriage, he got a hand job during a massage. Twenty years into a marriage, she made out with her personal trainer. That yes, she was attracted to because no one's ever hired a personal trainer in the long sordid history of personal trainers that they didn't want to fuck. You should be able to work through that. Yeah. Yeah, I heard um, I heard Esther say something just to come back to the women kind of speaking up. Uh, I thought I heard her say that like in especially in some countries you can still actually die to be a woman and admit that you had an affair. Yes. So it's scarier. Women are actually holding still a lot of fear to come out about their affair. Right. Yeah. Women were terrorized. Totally. Men were always allowed to cheat, have concubines, yeah. have mistresses, have multiple wives. Um, in the West, as marriage became more egalitarian. Uh, rather than extending to women the same license that men had always enjoyed, we imposed on men, straight men, the mm -hmm. same sort of limitations and terror campaign that women had always endured. And it's been a disaster for marriage. Yeah, yeah, totally. People um, are bad at monogamy. Totally, I mean, they to, are. To, or they're good at it. To pay, monogamy I'd say the, in general, that's true. Monogamy is the only thing where perfect execution over five decades is the only standard of success. You're only good at it if you could do it for five or six decades without error. Yeah. Well, you can fall down <laughs> snowboarding and get up and still be Sean White, world's greatest snowboarder, right? You fall down once, six decades of monogamy, you were terrible. Not only were you bad at monogamy because you cheated one time or had one affair, you never loved your partner. The whole relationship was a lie. You yeah, not what's only wrong with you? You only, not only betrayed your partner, you betrayed your children, your religion, your God, your community, your neighbors. It's bananas. Yeah. Given what we know about infidelity, why do we build monogamy up in such a way that when an infidelity happens, it destroys everything? You know, we experience infidelity as the ultimate betrayal because we call it that over and over mm -hmm. and over again. And then we then we've yeah. written a script for ourselves where that's how we have to feel it. And if we call, you know, we should be able to say, you're with somebody for six decades, they only cheated on you twice, they were really good at monogamy. They must have loved you a lot. Not, they were terrible at this thing. Yeah, they screwed it all up. Right, not they didn't love you. Yeah. I will say, just to speak for someone who is in a fulfilled marriage, doing monogamy well, and now, teaching other people. Now. Now. And teaching other people, like, no, you actually, it's okay to fall down. It's okay to fuck up. It's okay to raise your voice. It's okay. And you have, most people have highly unrealistic standards, which you're pointing out. And so to measure themselves against that is ridiculous. Plus, you were never taught how to work out your differences. Right. You were never taught how to listen until someone feels understood. You were never taught how to talk openly about uh, being unsatisfied sexually and just have a nice, open, honest conversation about it, right? So because you're not taught these things, then it goes underground and then you just, right. you know, it gets bad. So I'm, and if I'm you're just straight, taking you, a if stand. You're straight, you probably never had the tools to say what it is you wanted to do or, or would right. enjoy sexually. Um, right, so I'm just saying. Because you're only supposed to enjoy one thing. Yeah, and I'm saying I'm taking a stand for people doing monogamy well. And if that's what they want, I'm all if that's for that. their jam, I'm right? all for that. Part of doing monogamy well, uh, if you value the relationship more than the monogamous ideal, is uh, allowing for human failure in a monogamous relationship. Yeah, and allowing, allowing for Sean White to fall the fuck down. Yeah, and allowing your partner to be who they are. Right, and, and that means also allowing your partner, even in a monogamous relationship, a zone of erotic autonomy. Mm -hmm. You can't be all things to someone sexually. Yeah. Um, even a non-monogamous relationship where both people are free to do whatever, whenever, they're not going to get all their sexual needs met. It's not possible. Um, and so, you know, if you're with somebody and they have a foot fetish and they want to look at a lot of pictures of other women's feet, you can't grow 30 feet. Yeah. So and allow I them that, even if it's not focused on you. Our erotic imaginations roam widely. And yet we look at our partner and if we find any evidence that some part of their erotic imagination is going to a place where we are not. We explode in mm -hmm. a rage because that's all, all of that attention, their fantasies, their erotic imagination, that's just all ours. And we can't possess people like mm -hmm. that. You have to give each other some freedom. That doesn't mean that people should be inconsiderate and shitty to each other yeah, and rub each other's noses in it. Like if, 
you know, people have insecurities and people want to, you know, maybe they want to suspend their disbelief and be able to go through the day thinking that they're your everything, even though they know they're not. But mm -hmm. to be treated like that is nice. Then you cover your tracks a little bit and, and you make an effort not to rub their nose in whatever it is. On the flip side, though, if you know your partner's making effort and covering their tracks and deleting their browser history, if it's porn, that's a problem, and not rubbing your nose in it, if you stumble over evidence, well, then you turn a blind eye. You repay their effort and courtesy with your own effort and courtesy. Yeah, so are you saying if there's, let's say, porn in the house, are you saying, and someone's like, because they can't be sexually all things to all people or to, their, to one person, you're saying, just keep that, it's none of my business, like, do your thing? Yeah, do your thing, but do it in a way that demonstrates that my feelings matter too. Mm -hmm. You know, do your thing doesn't mean you're on your tablet next to me in bed looking at people that you would rather be fucking right now than me or fucking right now in addition to me. Yeah. Um, that means, you know, when you're with me, you're with me. And when you're on your own, if you want to like dive into pornography for a little bit and express some part of your sexuality, uh, live out in fantasy some experience that... I can't provide you, do that, but do it in a way that honors my primacy, my emotional security in this relationship. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a really important point. Is I'm but, but still... then what people what people do is they say, if you love me, you wouldn't do that ever. Yeah, right. And then people do it anyway because of course they're going to do it anyway because mm -hmm. erotic imaginations can't be constrained like that. Yeah. Uh, and then they find evidence that they did it anyway, and they explode in a rage. You're just engineering conflict in your relationship, and a relationship. Bring, enough conflict will come that if you can figure out how not to create it unnecessarily, mm -hmm. you're likelier to have a relationship that survives in the long term. Yeah, and if the if the um, exploring your sexual fantasies, let's say, is helping the relationship and it's not deterring, and all of a sudden I'm not feeling like secondary to your fantasies, you're saying that can work, right? That can work. And if it is secondary, let's say, then you need to get honest about your sex life and your relationship and maybe something needs to change. Or maybe you shouldn't have married that person. <laughs> right. uh, a lot of people uh, feel that they're bad people or evil people or deranged sex monsters if they prioritize sexual compatibility. Every day the letters come, oh, the relationship is perfect in every way, emotionally, socially. We want the same things, the same faith, we want the same number of kids. Everything is great. The sex is terrible. And it's always been terrible, and it gets worse and worse with each passing month. What do we do? It's like you break up. Mm -hmm. If what you want is a sexually exclusive relationship, right. you need to prioritize sexual compatibility. Mm -hmm. You're told, however, that if you prioritize sexual compatibility, if you not even put it first, but elevate it to the same level as emotional compatibility, social uh, compatibility, wanting the same things out of life, that you're a terrible person, that sex shouldn't matter, that sex is trivial. And that's just not true sex is hugely important sex mm -hmm. is more powerful than we are yeah we have to harness it it doesn't mean you know the lie i always say the lie we're told when we're children is one day we will grow up and have sex one day we grow up and sex has us sex is in charge sex is a quarter of a billion years old through natural selection and spontaneous mutation it built us it's building whatever is going to come after it's the most googled term us <laughs> it is in charge yeah. we negotiate with sex from a position of uh weakness you can channel it. That doesn't mean if you have desires, they must be acted on, particularly if ethically or morally they can't be acted on. But you have to find a way to work with who you are sexually and what you want sexually. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't, if you try to block that up or dam it up, it's going to explode yeah. and destroy a, a marriage, destroy uh, or you know, devastate children um, or you know, lead to scandal. You look at people like Mark Foley and Larry Craig and Ted Haggard and other famous closet cases who thought that they could knuckle under and have straight sex all their lives and uh, become prominent religious homophobes. Uh, not in Mark Foley's case, but the other two. Doesn't work. Yeah. Doesn't fucking work. Yeah. And how many times do we have to see it not work before we go, okay, you have to work with who you are, work with what you want, find somebody who wants enough of the same things or will allow you to be who you are and be able to have what you want with them and have the other things that you want through fantasy, through pornography, or with other people, if that's okay. Yeah. And find a way to realize your sexual interests, to fulfill your sexual uh, destiny, in a way, in that relationship, in the context of a relationship. You know, back to the foot fetish example, you know, I get a letter from a woman who's upset that her husband is a foot fetishist and wants occasionally to go to a foot fetish party where there's no sex. There's just like 
models walking around in their bare feet and guys laying on the floor. Definitely an erotic experience, not a genital, not mm-hmm. PIV. Yeah. Um, and he so wants to go to these parties. He used to go to them before he was married. It's just like endlessly frustrated that he can't go anymore. And Roe turns and like, what's going to happen if he goes? Not going to marry any of these Russian, Ukrainian foot fetish models in New York City. You're not going to run off with your schlubby middle-aged husband. You said he's a lawyer. Like, I think the ticket to that party is $200. I'm sure you guys can swing it. If it makes him content because he gets to have this experience uh, and then you guys don't have to fight about it anymore and then you aren't required to be all things foot for him which you say annoys you right <laughs> that just to me sounds like neither of us you know I hate mowing the lawn and so we hired somebody to do it yeah. outsource that shit <laughs> okay. awesome Dan it's been awesome I have a final question here for you okay as I said before I am started this relationship school and I'm just hip to help young people, especially, learn how to work out their differences and find uh, the tools and the view to have successful love relationships, whatever that looks like to them. And we want to reach a million teens. And so let's pretend uh, I had a stage of, I was on stage and I had a thousand teens teenagers? and adults. Yeah, people are getting trouble when they put me in front of teenagers. <laughs> well, let's say, you, great. Then you whispered in my ear uh-huh. one thing. You could only say one thing to them that you would want to impart to young people about love relationships what would you have me say to them oh my god there's just so many things I'd want to say to them uh, or want you to say to them you can't hide who you are you can't not be who you are figure out who you are and then put that person out there and someone who wants to be with the person you are will come along and that will be the right person Mm -hmm. for you as long as they're the person that they are Um, do you really have to accept and embrace yourself um and disinhibit. Look to your gay friends, if you have gay friends. And like, like exactly, because they're blazing the trail on how to be yourself. They couldn't be themselves if they didn't have the courage to to accept this thing and admit it. Mm-hmm. Um, accept yourself and admit it, and and uh, let go of the, the the concept of normal. I don't get letters from straight gay people who say, uh, like this is what's going on. This is what I want. Uh, is this normal? Um, because gay people already know that they had to let go of normal to be gay Um, there's all this research now that shows that when it comes to human sexuality variance is the norm that what we think of as normal sex missionary position within the bounds of matrimony opposite sex (laughs) you know in the master bedroom in the middle of the night in the dark that is a tiny minority of the sex that goes on on any given Saturday night on this planet Mm -hmm. it is freakishly abnormal that sex if you add all the sex in the animal kingdom going on on Saturday night on the planet, it is a right. tiny, a tiny, tiny, like <laughs> percentage, infinitesimal percentage of the amount of sex going on on the planet at that point. Um, there's a study out of the UK, and I'll end with this, uh, where they wanted to measure paraphilias. And a paraphilia is a non normative sexual desire. Okay. Um, para, I think, means not normal, and philia is like desire, love, eros. Um, and there's a, it's a, a very large sample size. They're trying to measure the prevalence of paraphilias, these non-normative desires. And what they found was a, a pretty significant majority of all of us have a paraphilia. So a paraphilia is not actually non-normative. It's normative mm-hmm. um, to have something about your sexuality that just isn't what anyone it would expect. It doesn't fit inside the lines. Right. right. And so embrace that. And, and prioritize sexual compatibility. If what you want is a sexually inclusive relationship, it's incredibly important to prioritize sexual compatibility, but you can't prioritize sexual compatibility until you've embraced who you are sexually, which sometimes takes some exploration discovery and discovery. Process, yeah. You know, some people, a lot of kids have access to porn. They think they're going to like X, Y, and Z. Then they do X, Y, and Z, and they don't like it. Um, they have to like figure out for themselves what works and then allow for growth and change over the decades of your relationship or your life. And to not to regard any every relationship that ends as a failure we talk about long-term relationships as always a success it's possible for a short-term relationship to be a success Mm -hmm. whether it's an evening a weekend six months five years of marriage 20 years of marriage uh it's possible to be in a shorter 20 years of marriage long-term relationship and both people emerge from it alive and for it to be a success Mm -hmm. the standard of success we have in relationships is death one of you died 
right? <laughs> you won. Death parted you. Good job. Yeah. Doesn't matter if the relationship is high conflict, emotionally or physically abusive. If you got to the funeral home still married, you win. If both of you, after 15, 20 years, parted ways are still incredibly close friends, always there for each other, still regard each other with tremendous affection. You lose. You lose. You yeah. fail. That's yeah. a failed relationship. No, that's a successful relationship. Yeah, absolutely. Compared against a death relationship that was miserable for the last 45 years. Right. <laughs> and if we get into people's heads that a successful relationship can be short term, that means they're going to make the best of a, of a relationship, even if they know it's only a hookup, even if they know it's only a one night stand, or because you know they're traveling in Europe or whatever, a thing that's only going yeah. to be for a week or two. Um, maybe if people have the concept of the successful short term relationship in their heads, they'll be more loving and compassionate and kind and generous, even with a partner that they're never going to see again. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thanks, man. Cool. Well, it's been awesome hanging out with you. I really appreciate what you're up to. And thanks, thanks. for all the, the love and the messages for everybody. <laughs> There you have it, the savage beast himself, Dan Savage. That was pretty uh, insightful for me. And I, when, you know, one of my highlights was when he talked about that gay people, young gay teens basically, have to deal with a personal development, personal growth path before straight kids do because you're, you have to come face to face with your identity. Who am I? In a way that straight kids have this sort of privilege to not look inward in the same way. Uh, that was really insightful and powerful, um, for me. Yeah. And just so many takeaways. So curious what yours were and let's have an action step here. All right. Let's have the action step be related to his inquiry that he's challenging you to sit with is, is monogamy really for me? Am I just subordinating to the indoctrination of my culture, telling me that monogamy and marriage is best if done with one person? Or am I in full choice here? Full choice that this is what I want to do. I am in full choice personally with my wife, and I want to challenge you to be in full choice so there's no resentment going on, there's no the grass is greener somewhere else, or what if... Just choose, wake up to that and choose. And then the more, uh, to take it deeper is talk to that, talk to your partner. If you have a partner, talk to them and say, Hey, I just listened to this monogamish podcast with Dan Savage. And he really challenged monogamy people to, to get, uh, get more honest. Really? Is this really what I want? Because like Dan says, and Esther Perel says this, which is the expectations on a marriage now are huge in terms of what one person's supposed to be. They're supposed to be your rock, they're a confidant, you're you're everything, your best friend, your challenger, your attachment figure, you're, you know, it's a lot to put on one person. And especially if you don't have an outside friend network and support system that's gonna that's really solid. It puts a lot of pressure on one person to get it right. And I think I think it is too much. Um, if you don't have a good network around you. So yeah, get honest, folks. Is monogamish perhaps better for me? Again, there's no right or wrong here. This is not about morality. This is not about better or worse. It's what's right for you and your future partner or your current partner or partners. You know, there's a hundred different ways to, to do relationship here. I'm certainly in the monogamy camp because that's just what's alive for me, but it might not be alive for you. That's fine. Um, so chew on that. Get back to us. Let someone in your life know where you stand. Uh, give yourself permission to have the desires and feelings you have and go there, you know, in your conversations first, setting context and getting really honest with yourselves. Okay, I'd love to have this guy back. Um, and if you want more monogamish or open relationship podcast episodes, let me know, you know, primarily we talk about one partner, long-term relationships, but you know, if the bulk of our listeners for somehow, somehow or some way switching to <laughs> open relationships, then, you know, I want to help you there as well. Obviously the, a lot of the tools apply, uh, that are the same, um, but there could be different things that we bring in if we went there more. Okay, and consider signing up for the Relationship School, guys. Uh, we're in our free web series right now. You can still sign up. You can still catch the first replay of Class 1, 
Class 2 is on June 25th. You don't want to miss this, all right? And then those replays are gone July 2nd as we enter into July. So now is your chance to get a free education in addition to this podcast that's really simple and awesome. Go to relationshipschool.net forward slash free class to join us. And if you want to apply for the Relationship School and talk to someone, you can certainly do that as well. Relationshipschool.net forward slash DPIR. All right, folks, thanks again. Talk soon.